what are the tools and components and characteristics of good urban design? And what is the relationship between good and bad urban design and good and bad families? Let's talk first about good urban design. Um, on the slide on the right um, is a little diagram of the um, components of the basic unit of urban design. Uh, we can call it a neighborhood, but what it consists of is a mix of uses uh, of got to take that back. Pointers right here. <laughs> so it, uh, it entails a mix of uses that includes uh, a set of public and civic buildings of, that, are, that are considered foreground buildings, a set of um, commercial and residential buildings that would be regarded as background buildings, and you put the two of them together, the public realm and the economic and private realm, and together you get the city. Now, it's characteristic of this city of a mix of uses um, that these uses are within pedestrian proximity. And by pedestrian proximity, if you look at uh, historic cities and historic city centers in their origins, you can see that um, they, they typically, particularly if you think about Roman colonial cities or Greek colonial cities, they occupied about 120 to 200 acres which is about a half mile by a half mile. And there's a significance to that because a half mile is a distance that a human being can walk comfortably in 10 minutes. So it means that at the center of these settlements, you would be not more than a five minute walk from the edge. And so it makes sense that this was the kind of settlement pattern that took place uh, in the days before uh, mechanized transportation. And so these are all examples here of um, historic city centers uh, circumscribed by a half mile diameter circle, Venice, Amsterdam, uh, and Florence. Um, and I show them just to give you an idea of the density of activities and the quality of culture that can exist in a very small geographical area. Um, now what I want to suggest is that this, you know, 150 acre or so um, unit of urban design is something that can exist in different kinds of, um, if you will, legal settlements, or at least uh, uh, types, types of settlements. So they can exist in the form, uh, I would say they, they exist in forms ranging from uh, a range of lower density to, lower density to higher density uh, settlements, uh, from the hamlet to the village to the town to the city neighborhood. And what's characteristic of each of these, and there's a plan above, for each of these and a three-dimensional drawing below for each of these. And what's characteristic of them is that they, as you go from the lowest density settlement, the hamlet, to the highest density city, the highest density settlement, the, the urban neighborhood, you are going from um, a low density, small area settlement to a higher density, higher area settlement uh, in each of this. But the point that I want to make is that each of these uh, has the same characteristics at a higher density or a lower density of that first diagram that I showed of this mix of uses within pedestrian proximity. Um, with respect to the idea of, uh, of a neighborhood of this kind of, this, uh, this kind of neighborhood that exists in the context of a larger city, um, this has been uh, illustrated very succinctly, I think, uh, by Leon Creer in his famous pizza uh, diagram, where if this is the city, right, or I say if, if, you, if you think of this as, as a diagram of a city large or small, but if you think of it as a small part of a city, it is analogous to a slice of pizza relative to the entire pizza. So if the entire pizza is the city, the slice is a neighborhood, and what's significant is that the slice of pizza has the same qualities as the rest of the city. Um, and that instantly differentiates it from the kinds of settlements that we've been making um, since the end of the Second World War, um, the post-war American suburban environment, which can be characterized by the separation of things into separate functional zones. And so it is analogous to uh, having the crust here and the sauce here and the pepperoni there and the cheese <laughs> over there. And so you have the ingredients of the pizza, but you don't have a pizza because you don't have the form 
uh, of the pizza. Um, and that's, that's a, a Leon Cruz, very succinct diagram of the difference between a traditional city and a modern city, or a traditional city and a, and a contemporary suburb. Now, um, at this point, I, I want to, again, differentiate between these kinds of traditional settlements and the post-war suburban settlement. This is a post-war settlement of, um, of a zone of housing. This is a zone uh, of, of retail activity, retail and office activity. And here, uh, let me introduce a thought about the hidden inherent systemic costs of post-war suburban culture and the practical burdens that they impose on families. These have been described succinctly by Charles Marone of the organization strongtowns.org. Though I add the caveat that part of what he describes relates to larger trends uh, in, in the global economy. Marone quotes the late columnist Earl Wilson that, quote, modern man drives a mortgaged car over a bond-financed highway on credit card gas. <laughs> and then he brings the hammer down. I'm going on to quote Marone. Debt to income and debt to assets ratios for US households have grown steadily during suburban expansion. That's because there is an enormous ante required to participate in the suburban version of the American dream. Two cars, two incomes, home, work, daycare, school, milk, and fun all require an enormous investment in time behind the wheel every day. It should be no surprise that younger Americans burdened with student loan debt and diminished job prospects are less and less willing to tie themselves to a 30-year mortgage and two car payments." End quote. Now, I want to make the point that traditional urbanism, as I've described it, um, does not mean high rises and high density. It does not necessarily mean high rises and high density. And in fact, traditional urbanism implies a range of lower density to higher density settlements. And one of the tools that has been developed by neo-traditional urbanists uh, is, a, is a tool called uh, a transect. And, it's, um, and it's, it exists precisely to express this range of settlements, these rain, this range of traditional urban settlements that are possible if you think about urbanism in this traditional way. And so the, the, uh, the idea of the transect is derived from, uh, originally from uh, environmental science. Uh, it's, it's over 100 years old, but it was uh, originally conceived by environmental scientists as a, as a way of thinking about a change in character uh, across, uh, you know, a, a, across a stretch of land. Uh, and so here, you know, you've got the ocean, the beach, the, the primary dune, the trough, the secondary dune, the back dune. Well, about 15 years ago, uh, Andres Duany and uh, Douglas Duany of the Congress of the New Urbanism made the connection between the idea of a, of a natural transect and what they described as a rural to urban transect. And so they, for which they've made endless uh, sequences of diagrams over the last 15 years. But the basic reality behind the rural to urban transect is that it is like a reality sausage uh, for traditional urbanism that includes the relationship between rural transect zones and urban transect zones. And these are, by urban transect zones, they mean traditional urban transect zones, so that the idea of the post-war suburb is excluded from the transect. But the idea is that the rural to urban transect is this uh, representation of the gradation in urban environments and also its relationship to uh, the natural landscape, which they've just, you know, for, for reasons of convenience, described as natural and uh, sort of untended by human beings and rural, which is um, uh, settlements like um, agriculture and um, golf courses and things like that, that that are tended by human beings. And so the point about that being is that like a sausage, you can slice the transect into any number of slices that you want to, potentially infinitely, but, but you tend to slice, we tend to slice sausage or bread in whatever seems to be the appropriate kind of, kind of piece. But uh, in, in these diagrams, which are kind of typical of the transect, uh, you get this range of urban settlements that run from the least dense to, to the, the lowest density to the highest density. Now, um, what I want to show, just for the, for the next three or four minutes, 
are a series of drawings that have come out of a project that, that a group of us at the University of Notre Dame have been working on for the last four years or so um, that have to do with trying to imagine uh, a metropolitan environment that has these characteristics that I've been describing about traditional urbanism and that um, uh, changes the land use patterns. Uh, we projected it forward 100 years because we have to have a story. This is not something that happens overnight. It's not something that happens, in our view, coercively. But we think it's something that, um, that at least is, is as plausible a scenario uh, for land use as, as, as some others that we can, that we can think of. And I want to say, I, I have uh, Arthi Wagre, uh, who's here visiting, is, is a Notre Dame uh, grad who came to see this talk. And Arthi worked on this project, was in the first studio that, that worked on this project. So this is an image of Chicago, metropolitan Chicago, seven counties. And that, what you're seeing here, uh, is the land coverage uh, of, that existed in Chicago, or exists in Chicago presently, uh, of, of um, the, the, the land coverage in these seven counties. And that's a depiction of it, looking at it from, uh, from Lake Michigan West. Next slide. OK, and I'm sorry, go back one. OK, so this is a slide of what our proposal would be for the year 2109. So go, go back and then go forward. So you can see how uh, we're assuming the same population but less land that is occupied, more green uh, uh, in the landscape. Next. So these are those two plans um, relative to each other. Uh, next. Okay, so this is that. This is a larger view of the existing conditions. Next. Um, this is the view of our proposed conditions. Next. And this is how we got to those proposed conditions. That is the existing public transportation network uh, in the city of Chicago. And so we're imagining that, that if that gets to be refurbished, the freeways don't go away, but, but the settlements start to take place along the rail lines uh, that extend out from the city of Chicago. And within again, within pedestrian proximity of the, of the public um, transit in the city of Chicago. So go back. Okay, so that's, that's the proposed land use. Go forward. That's its relationship to uh, uh, public transportation. Go forward. Um, that's those two drawings side by side. Next. And this is what the pattern of development was in Chicago in 1936. Okay. So what happened, what happened, go forward. Yeah, that's 1936. So this is 1936, is, was, which is a pattern, again, very similar to ours. Next. That's what it became between 1936 and today. Next. And that's what we propose. Next. Again, it's relationship to public transportation. Next. So um, I want to... I wanted to uh, end with two images, actually this, this slide and the next one, that shows on the left um, urbanism at the scale of the big city and on the right urbanism at the scale of a small town. Um, so this is a plan of, of downtown, the downtown central area of Chicago that we proposed for 2109. This is a plan for a um, um, suburban railroad suburb, uh, a new one uh, around an existing rail stop in, in the western, um, western Kane County. And I should say that this area here is about the same as this area right there. That's what's being depicted. But you can see this is all landscape, all agricultural landscape around it. Next. And then these are images on the left of what uh, that would look like uh, in the context of, again, Chicago, the development in, in downtown Chicago, and the development uh, in La Fox um, right here. So my second question was, what's the relationship between good and bad urban design and good and bad families? I think that most of us harbor an intuition that there is some relationship between good places and good families, between good urban design and good character. But the, but the precise relationship is not quantitative, and it often eludes us. Modernist architects and urbanists implied a kind of environmental determinism, that good architecture and urbanism will make people good, and bad architecture and urbanism will make people bad. Uh, alas, present-day neo-traditional architects and new urbanists sometimes seem to make the same argument. 
But this is completely wrong. The language of determinism in reference to families and cities is entirely false. A better way to understand the effects of good and bad design is suggested by an old Catholic moral admonition, the subtle realism of which impressed me long before I became a Catholic, that we should consciously seek to avoid proximate occasions of sin, which for me instantly raises the possibility of proximate occasions of good. So what I want to suggest here is that good urban design can be a proximate occasion of good for families, primarily through the classical Vitruvian architectural virtues of durable buildings, convenient buildings, and above all, in the cityscape, beauty, uh, with all of its sacramental um, and epiphany kinds of implications. So let me conclude that good urban design is important for families, not because good or bad urban design can cause families to be good or bad, but rather that good urban design can help families be better, and bad urban design can hinder families from being better. In Father Michael's December email to, uh, to me inviting me to speak um, uh, this afternoon on the family and urban design, he remarked with great understatement that this is, of course, a topic that could easily warrant a conference or two on its own. As always, Father Michael is right. Thank you. <laughs>